It's Father's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful fathers out there. Not just for being shining examples of how great a dad can be, but also for being wonderful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important. Just knowing you're there when we need you. You've been patient with us, helping us to grow and learn from all the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today, we thank you, Dad, for all of this and so much more. Happy Father's Day. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Victory of the Lamb. We're so excited to have you here worshiping with us, both online and in person. If you're here with us and you're able to stand, please do so and join us in our first song.
Good morning. Good morning. You may be seated. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. My name is Ben Sether, one of the pastors here. Uh, happy Father's Day to you all. Uh, Pastor Bill's got a great message as we continue to walk through this sermon series. Glad you asked. The sermon series based on your questions. Today we're going to talk about are only Christians going to heaven? We want to give you an opportunity to connect with us. You can use that QR code in front of you in the seat back, uh, one way to sign in. Uh, if you're worshiping online, you can use that connect button at the top of the screen. If you have any prayer requests, you can use that prayer request card that's in front of you. And then during our offering portion, you can hold that up and we'll make your prayers part of the worship service today. Well, it's no accident that you're here. Uh, there's all sorts of things going on in your life that have brought you to this moment. Maybe you grew up going to the church and, and your family kind of led you to this point and now you're here and that's just what you've always done. Maybe that's how you grew up, but for whatever reason you walked away and, and maybe it's a circumstance, something happened in your life that's brought you back. We're so thankful that you're here. Maybe for some of you, this is your first time here at Victory. Maybe something's happened in your life and someone uh, sent you a, a link to this service or they brought you here. I want you to know that no matter who you are, no matter what brought you here, welcome home. Welcome to victory. I want to give you an opportunity to greet one another. If you're worshiping online, you can greet each other in the chat room. If you're here in the ministry center, why don't you stand up and greet the people around you? We'll continue now with the section we call Forgive Us, Renew Us, Lead Us, a responsive reading, encourage you to join in. The amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Dear friends, one of the central truths that God has revealed to us about himself is that he is absolutely unimaginably holy. This means that he is without any shortcomings, imperfections, limitations, or sins of any kind. Therefore, compared to him, we see ever so clearly our own. We are so not like God. If God in his holiness is like a blazing fire, then we in our sins are like straw. It wouldn't make much sense to want to get close. And yet, God has also revealed that he is gracious, he actually invites us to approach him today because he has made a way to draw us close. He has made a way for us to be forgiven, declared holy, and renewed. That way is through his son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we approach God today. Heavenly Father, we come to you with our many sins, realizing that we are not always ready or willing to confess the wrongs we commit or the good things we fail to do every day. Likewise, we have often tried to ease our consciences with thoughts that we've tried hard to be basically good people. But the truth is, is that we're often just comparing our strengths with the weaknesses of others instead of with your standard of perfect holiness. Ultimately, there is nothing we can offer you to pay for our sins. Humbly, we rely completely on your mercy and grace. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive the sins we now confess, as well as the ones of which we are unaware. We come to you on the basis of your great promise of grace and forgive us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. When Jesus describes God, he describes him as a, a father, a father who's waiting for his wayward child to come home. And when his child does turn, repent, and, and comes home, even before he can say anything good or bad at all, his father runs out to him, wraps his arms around him, and throws a party for him. And God says that is what the Heavenly Father does every time you and I repent. That he welcomes us, celebrates, he throws a party for us in heaven. And so today I want you to be convinced because of Jesus Christ, you are a forgiven, loved child of God. And in Jesus, he's happy with you. And so now let's respond by worshiping him.
Why do we need to keep asking God for forgiveness? Do you have to be baptized to be saved? Will only Christians go to heaven? Why does God let bad things happen? Where did sin come from? What does God say about divorce? How do Christian values and politics interact? How do we support people with different views on sexuality? Let's pray. Lord God, as we come here this morning, we ask that you would meet us where we're at. You'd fill us with your grace and truth. You would relieve our burdens and that you would strengthen us and encourage us and fill us with confidence in your firm promises, which are all true and yes in Jesus. And we pray all these things, trusting in him. Amen. When John Niesbitt wrote his book in the 80s, Megatrends, one of the things that he said that culture was moving toward was a culture where there were limited and no choices to a culture of multiple choices. Boy, was he right. Have you ever been to the Cheesecake Factory to eat? <laughs> Menu's outrageous. That's nothing, though, compared to what the global chief marketing officer of Starbucks says. Says there's over 80,000 different ways to order your Starbucks coffee. In a time where there's so many choices and so many options, the Western worldview of today has concluded that it really doesn't matter how you worship or who you worship, that just as there are many ways, uh, many paths up to climb a mountain, so also there are many ways to God and to heaven and then obviously a better life. The 21st century Western worldview is, is that when a person dies, heaven is the default location. We see that as people joke around about hell, right? Hell is where the naughty people go so that they can even have a better time for all eternity, right? A better place in reality, heaven. We see that in our culture too when there's tragedies and crisis and, and the loss of life and all of a sudden all these crosses show up because heaven is the default location, right? And we hear and after all these tragedies and crises, you know, they're, they're heartbroken, obviously, and they say, but they're in a better place. With that kind of thinking, it's no wonder that in our culture, many people, Christians and non-Christians, wonder, isn't it wrong and isn't it arrogant of Christians to think that they only have the way to heaven? So as Pastor Ben mentioned today, we're continuing on the series that you helped us make Glad you asked. And the main question that we're going to be talking about and answering today is, will only Christians go to heaven? Okay. As you study worldviews and world religions, sure enough, a, a lot of them have some of the same teachings, right? Uh, in fact, most all of them have things like love your neighbor, don't steal, be kind, and live at peace. But just because some of the teachings are the same doesn't mean that they're fundamentally the same. In his book, Christianity for Those Who Aren't Christians, James Emery White uh, quotes the Dalai Lama and says that even the Dalai Lama says there is incompatibility between Buddhism and Christianity. That the Dalai Lama says you cannot be a Buddhist Christian or a Christian Buddhist. The, the differences are just too fast. Think of a fundamental difference between Christianity and Hinduism. Christianity teaches that there's one God. Hinduism teaches that there are millions of gods. 
Think of a, a fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam. Christianity teaches that Jesus is God and that there was a point in time in history where Jesus took on humanity into his divinity and that he lived and died for the sins of all people. In Islam, Jesus is not God and he's not even the top prophet. He's not even the top God of Islam. And so for people to think that all religions are, are really all headed to the same place, at best, that's actually ignorance of what all the world religions teach. And at worst, it's blatant dishonesty. See, all the world religions really aren't trying to climb the same mountain. They're on different places on the map to begin with. And as we think about worldviews today, too, I think, you know, one of the worldviews that we have here in the West is if you're sincere, that's what matters, okay? As long as you're sincere, it's good. You can't say anything about it because they're sincere. Well, I want you to know you can be sincerely wrong. Take, for example, Hitler. He sincerely thought he was doing the world a favor by exterminating and murdering about six million Jews. Go back to 9-11, the people who hijacked those planes, they sincerely thought that what they were doing was good and noble. And as we gather today and, and celebrate Father's Day here in our country, we also are celebrating June or Juneteenth Day, right? And, and so what that leads us to do is go back into our country's history and realize that there was a time when people thought it was sincerely okay to have slaves. You can be sincerely wrong. Another example, when I used to play basketball during a game, I never took a shot that I sincerely thought I was gonna miss. I thought I was gonna make every shot. I was sincerely wrong, right? <laughs> Others try to find assurance of a, a better place to live, you know, after they die, a heaven by being good, uh, a goodness quotient, if you will. And so people, and you guys know this, we know this, compare ourselves to other people. We don't compare ourselves to the holy God, we compare ourselves to other people. We compare like we confessed in the confession, our strengths with other people's weaknesses. And so we and others will say things like this, I'm not perfect, but, right? I, I'm not perfect, but at least I didn't do that. And the whole thinking behind on that really is we get to the better place because God's going to grade on the curve. We kind of like that idea. Grading on the curve. I know I did when I was in school, right? You take the test, the test is really hard and the teacher informs you she's gonna grade on the curve. Oh, whew, good, right? So you get your test back and it's a, a 75, but instead of getting a C or a D, it happens to be the high score in the classroom. And so you actually get an A. That's good stuff, right? That's good. Or maybe you're taking that same test. You don't get the 75, but you get a 50. But since it's graded on the curve and the 50 is actually a median score, then you get a C. And again, you're going, that's awesome. Good stuff. But the thing is, is God doesn't grade on the curve. We want life to be fair. But if you look around, you know it's not fair, right? Uh, an easy example for me is from this last week. The storms came through. I didn't lose electricity, but some of you did. And for more than just an hour or two, right? How fair is that? We want the world to be fair. We want God to be fair. But heads up, God's not fair. But check it out. God is better 
than fair. God gives us grace, which is something that we don't deserve. See, that's what makes Christianity different than all the other world religions. C.S. Lewis was asked, what's the difference between Christianity and all these world religions? And he said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. Grace is the totally free and undeserved love of God. And to see how grace distinguishes Christianity from all the other world religions, what we need to do is check out the nature of God. Okay? The nature of God. God is holy. He is without sin. He hates sin. Sin cannot be in his presence. He is holy. He is pure. He has never messed up once, not even for a second. Another part of God's nature is that he is unconditionally loving. Okay? And so, at least from our perspective, in our minds, that's a great tension because he's hating sin and unconditionally loving sinners. Okay? And so when God came up with his law, his law is an expression of who he is, his holiness and his love. And so when you and I disobey the law, what's really going on is we're not so much disobeying the law as we are disobeying God. And that brings us to our nature. Sure enough, sometimes we obey God, but sometimes we, as you know too, disobey God. And when we disobey God, that's called sin. And the word sin is really a, an archery term, which means to miss the mark, to miss the bullseye, to not get it exactly right. And this is what scripture says about us in Romans chapter three. It says, all, and what's the word all mean? All, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, okay? And sin can't reconcile sin. Sinners can't reconcile sin. We can't take care of it ourselves. And sin, if it's unresolved, locks the door to heaven. No way in. Okay. The only one who can resolve sin is and reconcile sin is one who has no sin, and that's God. And in the Old Testament, what God did is he set up the Old Testament sacrificial system, which was if someone sinned, then an unblemished, a pure and unblemished animal had to be sacrificed because God was pointing the way to how he was going to resolve and reconcile sin once and for all, and that was by sending his son, Jesus. The New Testament says of Jesus, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look, the Lamb of God, the unblemished one who takes away the sin of the world. See, Jesus had to die because of God's holiness. Jesus was willing to die because of God's unconditional love. God's holiness and love that all collided right on top of Jesus when Jesus was on the cross. Scripture says it this way, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's grace. We don't deserve it. Totally free and undeserved. And if someone would ask, then how can a loving God send someone to hell? I bet you've heard that, and you've maybe even had that question too. Understand, to ask that question in the first place is not to fully understand our nature, our sinful nature. Because you see, if, if we understood human nature, what would shock us is not that anyone would go to hell. What would shock us, what would blow us away would be that anyone would go to heaven. 
How can a loving God send someone to hell? Well, that would be a great question if God had already not in love sent Jesus to pay for the sins of the whole world. See? Our nature rejects God. It's our nature, people's nature, their choices, our choices that would send people to hell. Because you see, God actually doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Okay? Not a single person. This is what the scriptures say from 1 Timothy. God, our Savior, wants all. Remember what all means again? All to be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. See, the existence of heaven and hell, what that really shows us is that there is a moral and good God. And we want a good and moral God, right? We don't want a God who's going to be sitting up there in heaven and chuckling over things like murder and rape and abuse, and pain, and sickness, and suffering. I get it that hell is disturbing, but it's also an illustration that we have a good and moral God, which leads people to ask the question, what happens for those people who've never had an opportunity to hear about Jesus? This is what the scripture says there from Romans chapter one. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. This is called the natural knowledge of God. And the natural knowledge of God leads all people to seek out God, to seek out the God of truth. See, we all have this, whether anyone's ever gone to church or not. They all have the, we all have the natural knowledge of God that you and I could look out into creation with all its colors, with all its beauty, with all its grandeur, with all, with all the, the things that are so small that we need microscopes and things like that to see, with all of its vastness, that you and I would look out into creation and not be blown away by the amazing God is a sign of just how much sin has infected us too. The natural knowledge of God teaches us that all people, have a responsibility to seek out God, okay? And furthermore, as we think about this question, for me, I'm not so concerned about the character of God because in my mind, he's already taken care of that by sending Jesus. He's already shown his character for us. What I'm concerned about, uh, about those people, when we ask the question, what about the people who haven't had the opportunity to hear about Jesus? What I'm concerned about is my character. Okay? So I don't know about you, but have you thought about that, that person? You know, in my mind, it's always that person uh, in Africa, out in the bush, they, they've never heard about Jesus. What about them? I'm concerned about my character, though. What about my neighbors? What about the people I go to work with? What about the people that I do recreation activities with? Have I shared Jesus with them? Huh? Am I so concerned about someone that I don't see, but I don't show it to the people who are in my sphere of influence? See, there's a reason why you and I live where we live. And we work where we work and we have fun doing the things we have fun doing things we have fun with because that's our sphere of influence. That's the mission field that God has placed us in. 
See, the, the real deal is it's not on God, it's on us. Here's what's going on today too, and, and maybe you know this too, and maybe you feel this way. Today, Satan has presented the lie that it is unloving to proselytize people. That is unloving to share the good news of Jesus. It's unloving to hope that people would come to believe that Jesus is their savior. It's really forward and aggressive and, and unloving to share Jesus with others. I, I, I don't think that's unloving at all. I think what's unloving is to know that Jesus is the savior of the world and then not tell others. I think it's unloving to know the way for people to be saved and, and not share it. Just think of it this way. In my mind, this is how it works. Is if you and I were a lifeguard and we're at the pool and someone's drowning and we see it, and we don't do anything about it? That's apathy at best. It's hatred at worst. It's not on God, it's on us. Which brings us back to our question. Will only Christians go to heaven? Well, most people all over the world, most people all over the world consider Jesus to be a good teacher. So let's see what Jesus, the good teacher, says about heaven and hell. From Luke chapter 13. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. Then there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. A narrow way. And this is what Jesus says about the narrow way. The good teacher, Jesus, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't teach, I am a way. There are many others. There are few others. There is at least one other. No, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. The belief, the teaching that there are many ways to heaven, many ways to God, is to tell Jesus, the good teacher, you're not a very good teacher. It's to tell Jesus, the, the good teacher, Jesus, you're actually a liar. To say that there are many ways to heaven is to tell to Jesus, uh, you died on the cross for nothing. That was absolutely a waste of time. Hmm? Thankfully, God grades us on the cross and not the curve. Because you see, while a, a 75 in class, if that's the top score, there's still some issues there, right? But on the cross, Jesus has taken away all of our sins. He has reconciled that whole sin issue. See, the gift of salvation, it can't be worked for, earned, or achieved, only received. We don't merit it by our effort. It's ours only by the generous and full and complete 
substitutional sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay. All these questions about heaven, you know the way. The way is Jesus. You don't have to be concerned about the future. You're safe in his arms. God loves you. Okay. Now that you know the way, right, you can share the way with joy and love and peace and patience because God loves all people. See, we don't just need salvation. We need Jesus. Ultimately, the greatest gift that God gives us is the gift of himself. Jesus, our Savior and the world's Savior from sin. Jesus is grace personified. And the way that is open to everyone, to God and heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for sending people into our lives to share the wonderful message of forgiveness of sins and salvation through Jesus. Lord, help us to cherish that. Love that teaching. Be comforted by it. Receive it with joy and love. May it give us strength and assurance. And Lord, lead us to share it too. Because you love all people. All people. And you have provided the way for all people. And so Lord God, in the, in the midst of our culture, in the midst of all that's going on, just help us keep our eyes focused on you to cherish what you've done for us and what you've done for all people and then share those things with love and joy. We pray this in your name, amen. Great job, Pastor Bill. Thank you. We'll continue now confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is a way that you can personally confess what we believe, these, these historical teachings that God is our creator. We can see what he's done in nature. Jesus is that Savior, the only way, and the Holy Spirit who brings us to faith. Let's speak these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. At this time, if you have any prayer requests, you can hold up the prayer request card and someone from our team will come around and gather those. If you have an offering, you can always give your offering at votl.life. If you have a physical offering, you can leave it in the basket on the way out. One way that your offerings are being used is to allow us to have a live stream. Um, there's cost that goes into that, into training volunteers, into having the equipment, to have the license and the subscriptions to be able to, to live stream. And through that live stream, literally people all over the world are worshiping with you. So thank you, thank you for your generosity. We'll continue now with this week's announcements. Hi, I'm Sammy, and here are your announcements for this week. On behalf of the staff here at Victory, we want to wish all those dads and fathers figures a happy Father's Day. We thank you and appreciate you for guiding your families to get to know their Heavenly Father. As always, we encourage you to go to VOTL.life, our insider website, to help you find your next step on your path to victory. We've got two different opportunities for you to help Victory show our love for our community. 
You can sign up to support our water bottle handout at the Franklin Civic Celebration Parade on July 4th. And you can volunteer at our community concert with a playlist happening on July 16th. And I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for allowing me to help you get connected here at Victory and in our community through video announcements and all our platforms over the last four years. Although I won't miss seeing my face on the screen every time I come to worship, I will miss connecting with all of you. Next week, you'll see Kelsey in our video announcements. So don't worry, you'll still get updates on how you can get involved in Victory every week during worship. That's it for this week, and now we'll continue with our worship service. Thank you for your prayers. Today we'll pray uh, a prayer of thanks for our fathers. Uh, also pray for uh, the celebration of Juneteenth, uh, that event where uh, the news of the freedom uh, of, from, for slaves finally reached Texas in 19, or 1865. And then we'll also pray for um, Stacy Shoemaker's mother, Lisa, um, for her surgery. Lord God, let's pray. Lord God, we, we thank you uh, for giving us the way. Uh, we look at our lives and all the ways that we have fallen short, and you told us it's through Jesus that we are family with you again, that we become your children and we are saved we pray, Lord God, that we don't just think about this or discuss this or ask questions about this, but that we would share this message to all those who do not yet know that you love them and forgive them in Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of fatherhood. We pray that you would make all of us fathers, the kind of fathers that represent who you are to our children. Lord God, we pray a prayer of of uh, remembrance today, remembering Juneteenth. We, we pray that you would lead us to celebrate our equality in Christ because we are all made in your image. Lord God, we pray for Lisa, Stacy Shoemaker's mother. Um, we pray that you would give her a quick recovery after her surgery. We ask all this in your name, and now we pray the prayer you taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our final song.
Great job, music team. Maybe seated. Well, again, happy Father's Day. Make sure you grab a donut from the donut wall on your way out. Uh, if you're new here, Pastor Bill would love to meet up with you by that orange brick wall. And uh, may the Lord bless the rest of your day.